Today we have MC who's going to be talking about infinite banking and never tax accounts to turbocharge your investments. Um, Ryan, could you put me through to the disclosure slide, please? Uh, we have a disclosure here at Cama Plan. It just means that we're not giving you any tax or legal advice that if, if you have any real questions for your investments, you should consult a real professional such as a CPA, an accountant, an attorney, a tax specialist. This is just educational information for um, investors to build their knowledge of investing and see what other options are available out there. Um, so I'm not sure the screen's not working very well there. Um, I apologize for some technical difficulties. We, uh, we are trying some new quarantining social distancing practices in the new year and Ryan's in a different location than usually. So MC, why don't I turn it over to you and can you give the audience a little background about yourself? Absolutely. Um, if you, I think you're going to uh, have me, make me share my screen. It's, it's here. It's not, um, I can't share my screen yet. But as you're waiting for this, I'm really excited to share some insights with you, some strategies and some things uh, that we're doing in our community. Uh, and I'm pretty excited to, to, get, uh, to get into today's presentation with you. So let me just share my screen here. And uh, I'm going to maximize value for everyone that joined us on this presentation today. In this presentation, before I get into to who I am and <laughs> who's, who's the guy with this purple background and this crazy cash flow ninja on here, before I get into that, the conversation that I'm going to have with everyone today is how to use infinite banking. And I'll explain what that is if you've never heard of it before and never tax accounts to turbocharge, turbocharge your investments uh, and your retirement. So there's that guy with the smiley face. That's me. So uh, my name is MC Lobster. I'm the creator and host of um, Cashflow Ninja. It's a top rated business and investing podcast. And I also have another show called Cashflow Investing Secrets. Um, this was a, a, a passion project and passion, ho a hobby uh, that I started that turned into a, a full blown business we've been now been downloaded to and listened to in over 180 countries with over 4 million downloads i'm also the founder of producers wealth uh we uh create a wealth strategy for clients in in 50 states virtually of the united uh in the united states um a lot of them are business owners and a lot of them are investors and i'm a cash flow expert that help these business owners and investors create recover warehouse and multiply their cash flow. On the show, I've been very privileged to learn from some of the best investors out there. And I, I'm really still a student. I love learning. I love growing. I, I love learning new things and learning from people that have walked the walk. Uh, so I've been privileged to have folks on my show sharing their journey, such as Robert Kiyosaki, Grant Cardone, Jim Rogers, which I've had several times on. I always learn a ton from Jim, um, presidential candidate, and and uh in investor uh ron paul kevin harrington from the shark tank and also um russell brunson cashflow ninja is the one show the cashflow investing secrets the other show by the way i've had a fantastic time having carl and ryan on my show too sharing their journey and sharing how to use self-directed investing to power your retirement uh and your investments a little bit about my journey. I just wanted to share a couple of conceptual things, aha moments that I had and where this basically led me to do what I do today uh, and share the strategy, what, which I will share with you on this webinar. So everyone has seen that little purple book. My mother actually uh, gave me this book uh, almost two decades ago, uh, put this in my hand and it was, a, it was a game changer for me as it was for a lot of people. A lot of people learned uh, that there was a different way of thinking about money and investing. Um, and it was a massive paradigm shift. 
a different worldview, a different look at money. And one of the big things about that book was uh, to, you know, that to have your money work for you to generate cash flow, to build uh, assets that generate cash flow to fund your to fund your uh, uh, lifestyle. Um, and that was huge. So a lot of people, when they think of that book, they think about the rich don't work for money. They build assets uh, that they then uh, utilize and, and that generates cash flow for them. Um, and they also think, I mean, the one word that's, that really, really, really stands out there is cash flow. Very interesting thing about that book. Um, I actually read it every single year. Um, and it's amazing that every single year I get a new lesson from it. You know, we've all heard the cliche that, you know, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. Um, and there's a couple of things that I picked up on that book. The first time I read it, it's like cash flow, it's great paradigm shift. The second time I read it, I looked at it and I said, this is very interesting. This is actually a book about accounting, which uh, Robert Kiyosaki later said it was all about accounting and income statements and balance sheets and uh, a fun way to explain very powerful accounting concepts in a, in a very digestible format. So I started looking into this more and started learning, learning and studying a little bit more of accounting. And I, I learned all about cash flow statement, income statements, balance sheets, and how it, it's supposed to flow. And, you know, the, the, the example in the book was using the poor, the middle class and the rich and their different uh, financial statements. And I looked at a debtor's financial statement, but I also saw a creditor financial statement because I looked at the one thing and said, well, some, a lot of this, if you, if you add the two together, which is a liability for someone else is an asset for someone else. And I kind of started to see the flow between this. So this piqued a lot of my interest. And then a year later, you know, when the student's ready, the teacher appears, I had this big aha moment. I looked at my own financial statement and I said, wow, the mortgages, the HELOCs, the auto loans, the student loans, the credit cards, the personal loans, the business credit lines, the business loans, they're my liabilities, but they're all assets of the bank. The bank has got this figured out. And the lesson that I learned from rereading that book at that point in time was, I got to figure out how to become my own bank. How do we become our own bank? Because banks really know the game of money because they were part of creating this new money system and game that we're all playing in currently. And it is, it is a game. Um, and I started looking in what, what, what do banks do? Let's take a look at this. They've got it figured out. All of my liabilities are their assets. They're creating all of this on demand. Let's take a look at their model from a business perspective as we're approaching our own financial life and the management of our own wealth as a business. They have a constant flow of deposits into them. People put money into a bank for many different reasons. They used to get a nice, decent return in some of their products, but there's still benefits to it, online banking and bill pay and, and so forth. They have a very low cost uh, of capital, and which is very important for business owners to understand their cost of capital in anything. Now, where does the bank get their money from? There's different places, obviously depositors, and obviously they get it through the Federal Reserve System, which we have here in the United States. But wherever, it, regardless of where it's coming from, it's, they have a very low cost of capital. And another thing that I notice is that they warehouse their capital very efficiently. If you look at where uh, banks actually put a lot of their capital, and especially their tier one capital, which is their safest capital that they have, it's very, very interesting, and I will actually touch on that today. It's not a surprise to everyone that real estate is a big one, uh, that, the, that banks are invested in themselves. And then I also saw they collateralize capital really well, and I'll get into what, what that means to me and how, uh, how uh, and I'll share several examples of how you can do that yourself. They leverage capital really well. They create assets that pay them income very, very powerful on the back end of their business model. Uh, all of those liabilities that I just described as the assets of the bank, which they create on demand. Um, and also, here's another a very important lesson I learned from a business perspective, is that they create some uh, symbiotic revenue streams and have multiple profit centers. 
So not only do they create revenue streams, but they all kind of feed off one another. How many times have you sat down in a bank um, and you've opened an account and the next thing, you know, they're trying to sell you a credit card. And then from the credit card, there's, hey, by the way, how about that mortgage? Do you want to refi your mortgage? Um, do you have any auto loans? We've got a low rate that we can refi that auto loan for you. So before you know it, you've got all these verticals that are symbiotic and basically part of their, their revenue uh, center. It's multiple profit centers for them, for them as well inside of it, inside of banking operations. So if we look at a very basic, just an example of how profitable banks can be, and I really, uh, I, I stripped this down to, to just the fundamentals of it. We could really complicate this if we wanted to, but essentially in the banking system, as I described, there's a couple of things that happen. So we make deposits into the bank. Uh, they pay us some, some or little interest. Um, and on the back end of it, as I explained, they create assets that generate income from them. They're all symbiotic. Um, and they have multiple profit centers. So in this example, and this is another big moment that I had was if you had to deposit $10,000 into the bank, let's just say hypothetically, I, I would do that and the bank would pay me 1% on that. Then, you know, they're going to pay me, pay me a hundred bucks on that. Um, and on the back end, they would lend out that $10,000. Let's just say through an auto loan or, you know, business line of credit or so forth. And let's, Let's just say, for example, to keep the math simple, that they're generating a 10%. Now, most people would say, generating that 10% return, you know, MC, this is, this is pretty powerful. There's a 9% spread. But the one thing that, that is extremely powerful in, in, in this example is that the only money that the bank had in that transaction was only the, the, the $100 because I put the money in there, they paid me the interest of a hundred bucks from obviously the, the, the money that they generate on the back end. So if you take the thousand minus the 100, you get to 900 bucks in profit in that, which actually goes to 900% of profit. And we haven't touched fractional reserve banking. We're not gonna get into that. <laughs> we could get really complicated with that. But my point that I wanted to drive home was big, massive aha moments for me paradigm shifting moments was cash flow and then you have to figure out how to become the bank um, because they have figured out proper cash flow management structures to really amplify all of these many different things that they're doing now when we look at a strategy you know most of us will you know we're we're easily confused as humans we are because we're designed that way uh, from a survival mode, but also we're marketed to and from so many different areas. We get hit with marketing and on everything that we touch, whether it's social media, whether it's listening to a radio show in a car, a podcast, whether it's um, whether it's uh, watching TV, uh, watching Netflix or, or any other uh, platform that you use. So there's a lot of information out there. So um, what we broke it down from a, from a strategic point of view is, is you know, and, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about is how do you create a strategy? How do we create a strategy in uncertain times too, is we try to keep it simple. We try to keep it very simple from A to B. So in order to, to get, get a very, very, very simple strategy that's easily um, implemented and executed on, we need to know where we're going, right? If we're going from point A to B, and the fastest way to get there is a straight line, as I mentioned in this slide. Before I jump into a strategy too, there's many different uh, ways to describe a strategy, uh, but it's basically what you do and how you do it and how it gets you to where you wanna go from point A to B. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about an aligned cash flow strategy. Another thing, uh, that I've learned, and this is a mistake that I've made too, uh, that I think many investors make, is they're very, very scattered. Their resources are not aligned behind their goals, their vision, uh, their targets, where they want to go. And that's why sometimes, even if they get there, it takes them much longer 
um, where I've seen personally in our network where folks align their resources um, and their talents and their skill sets uh, and, and, and put it straight to where one, they want to go towards their goal. And because they're doing that, they get there much faster. You know, we've seen some folks get the results that would take people 30 to 40 years and get it within five years. Uh, there's actually um, someone in our network. She's very, very talented that that been able to accomplish that. And it's just mind blowing. And one of the key lessons there it was she aligned everything. There was, it wasn't really scattered. So I'm going to share a little bit of the strategy that we uh, put together to, that you and, and framework for crafting and building your strategy uh, that's going to help to get you to your goals and your targets much quicker in 2021. Um, there's a couple of different components in our community. We talk about creating cash, being a cash flow creator, being a cash flow core builder, building up the core muscles as we would working out as well, um, and making sure that the core and the foundational pieces are in place. And then there's a system to multiply cash flow and the multiplier um, program. And then there's also a, a, a quantum experience where you really take everything to the next level. So how do we build a strategy? A couple of things. Here's lessons uh, from over the, the past couple of years, and especially uh, the previous year in uncertain times, uh, it's very, very important to have clarity. And that's the first thing that we want from a principle standpoint, right? C clarity is going to be one of your biggest assets uh, in the environment that we're finding ourselves in, in currently. You know, I see a lot of things out there on social media and so forth. And, and I see the, the one camp is positivity, 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 which is great but I prefer to have clarity before I become positive and optimistic because if you're sitting on a, on a train track and you put your head down and you're positive, that train is still coming over you. So get up, look, get clear of what the dangers out there, the opportunities, your strengths, and how you can play in the environment to still get to your goals and still get to your targets. So clarity is the first principle from the aligned cash flow strategy. The second principle is control. We want to be in control uh, of our cash flow, our money, our investments. And that's why I love speaking to groups such as this, because this is what it's all about uh, through self-directing and having control in other areas of your life. Uh, collateralization is huge. I'm going to talk about what that means in a little bit. Congruency, very, very, very important. Also, knowing what you have, why you have it, and, and what it's doing for you. Um, a lot of folks that we've spoken to in the, in the past couple of years, um, you know, when they find out what they have and where their money's at, it wasn't necessarily even aligned with their principles and their values and what they stand for. And we're huge on that. We're huge on principles and values, core values, because that really drives everything else that you're doing, right? Because everything starts with you and in, in your own home and in, in your own environment. So uh, you want you want to absolutely have that and that and then cash flow, as I mentioned. So those are just principles that we utilize in a framework. Um, then, of course, if we're going to design a strategy, which I've mentioned, we want to go from A to B. We don't want to go you know, all over the place in that previous slide. We need to have some principles in place for decision making, but then we also need to know how to track our progress and where are we going. So the scorecard that we use is we want to first get to financial security. And there's a couple of things that that uh, that entails. You know, one of the big things that we talk about is having sufficient reserves in place because bad things happen to good people every single day. Emergencies will happen. Challenges will come into life. So six to 12 months, for example, of cash reserves um, at the end of 2019, we recommended 12 months of cash reserves. We're actually through the past year have told folks to even take it up to 18 to 24 because in uh, recessions or in volatile times that there are chaos, that there are disruption, uh, you want to have access to capital because there's going to be plenty of opportunities for all of us to capitalize on. So the, the second piece is financial independence, and that's when you have enough cash flow coming in from your leveraged income assets that will cover your living expenses. So if it takes about $10,000 to run your household and pay all of your bills, when you have over $10,000 in, in leveraged income, passive income, 
uh, coming in, then you're, then you're financially independent. Financial freedom, there's different ways to do that. It's, it's relative for a lot of folks. Um, you can multiply at that stage um, the number uh, because it, fi what financial freedom means is money no longer becomes a reason why or you're, why or why you're not doing something. And then financial significance is obviously giving back. And you could start with significance right away is what we always said. You know, you could give today, even if there's no, no money, there, there, there's time. So that, that's sort of the scorecard. We've got our principles. We've got a scorecard. I keep it very simple, straight line from A to B. You make money, you create cash, whether it's in your business, whether it's an investor, whether it's in your uh, employment. Uh, as a professional, then you've got to put position your money somewhere. And that's where we're going to focus on a little bit. But I wanted to give you the big picture of the framework. So you make your money, you position your, your money somewhere, money has to reside somewhere. So we're going to talk about where, where, where are two great areas to put that. And then you deploy that money to invest in assets that produce cash flow and put it back. There's also cash growth uh, opportunities in it and then cash control. Um, ca what cash control means is proper protection of everything that you create and produce and that you, uh, where you position your capital and then also where you deploy it. So proper tax strategy planning, proper estate planning and proper asset protection is, is absolutely key to put it in there. We've sort of bro broken it down um, in a very easily digestible format. It's interesting, a lot of folks that I interview as well they all have these different pieces in place. It's, it's a similarity with uh, after doing over 650 <laughs> episodes and interviewing folks that this is what they have if you really want to break it down of, of how they do it. Um, then if you want to get tactical a little bit, I know that we've talked about principles. We've talked a little bit about a scorecard. We've talked about a framework that you, you can use to build um, a overall wealth strategy for you. Tactical, tactically, there's a couple of things that you can do. So the pyramid that, that we look at, you know, obviously, um, obviously your mindset, your capabilities, your communities are your strengths. And that those are the things you should be investing in every single time. Um, then when we get to building up our liquidity, we're going to talk about that a little bit, having proper credit in place, having proper cash, infinite banking, self-directed, uh, uh, vehicles, gold and silver, some crypto exposure, insurances, having the proper protection in place, and then asset protection, having those proper protections in place as well before we get to the next level of investing in businesses, uh, which could be in a variety of different ways in cash flow producing assets and growth assets and also in, in equities. So that's just a quick tactical slide. I want to talk about a little bit about... Um, just collateralizing and collateralizing assets. So collateralizing assets is a couple of things. So we all know or have heard about a little bit, and this is a question that I get quite a bit, and I get actually pretty, I'm pretty excited to when I talk about collateralization because it's essentially, um, it's essentially utilizing one asset without selling it to acquire another asset, which is pretty, pretty powerful stuff. So. Um, a mentor of mine, I'll start with a story. This is almost two decades ago, which just completely blew my mind at that stage. You know, this, uh, when I got started on my journey, but this mentor of mine, actually, they utilized um, CDs in a bank in the, in the banks in the 70s. And what they would do is they would go to a bank and they would deposit money in there. Uh, let's just say 100K. And they would say, Mr. Banker, you know, I have $100,000. Can I put it in a CD? And at that stage, like I said, it was double digit interest that they were, that they were uh, earning on that. And then they would, uh, the banker would say, well, absolutely, abso absolutely. Uh, sorry, let me go back here. Absolutely. We'll, we'll absolutely give, uh, 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 sell you a CD. You could put your money in there. They would then go back to that same bank and then uh, ask that banker, Mr. Banker, can I get a loan secured by the CD that I have in, your, in, in the bank? And the banker would say, well, we took the deposit in, we're paying interest on that on the back end, absolutely we'll make a loan. And it will give them, the bank would issue them a loan and approximately 90% of the, 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 the CD that they had. They then would take that money, they would buy a property, fix it up, rent it out, uh, and then pay down the loan and then also, you know, generate cash flow in, in the process. And what they did there essentially 
is took the money, positioned it very, very effectively and efficiently, got a loan uh, by, by using that, that money as collateral, and then taking that and then buying real estate and then paying the loan back and then producing cash flow in the, in the same process. And my mind was just simply blown. I kind of, uh, you know, became obsessed with how you can collateralize certain assets and use many different assets in many different ways. Uh, so this is important to know, maybe just some food for thought as you're creating your strategy and building out a strategy that you might have resources that if positioned a certain way that you could leverage and utilize to go out and, uh, 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 purchase more assets. And also, um, it might be something just to, to ponder where you allocate capital um, so that you can eventually leverage it to uh, capitalize on opportunities that, that will present themselves. Uh, so here's a couple of other examples. Most business owners know that they can collateralize their business, the assets and the receivables from a business, um, and get access to credit lines and loans. We had actually had someone in our community that uh, got a business loan uh, uh, through collateralizing the assets of the business and the receivables of the business, and he utilized that loan to purchase the building from which his business was operating. Took the business to buy the building without selling the business, and now he has two assets. Um, great collateralizing strategy. Real estate, we all know about HELOCs, which is a very powerful strategy where you can purchase a real estate property. You can, you can access the equity in that property without selling it and then go and buy another one, right? Or refi, another great strategy. With stocks, asset-based lending uh, is available on certain stock portfolios. Um, again, do your diligence on all of these. There's a couple of different ones. I prefer a couple of those. Some of them have a, uh, have a lot of risk involved with it. Like for ex example, the stock. So this is something that you really want to know um, what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you can protect yourself and know everything that you need to know before doing something like this. I just want to share this for educational purposes. Um, so you can absolutely collateralize some stocks uh, and um, get a loan secured by that and then go buy real estate with it. Savings, we covered the CDs on it. Uh, permanent life insurance, which we'll get into a little bit too, uh, where you can get policy loans that's secured by the cash value and the death benefit of the policy. Here's a fun one. Your gold and silver can be collateralized. There's some custodians that will issue up to 50% of the value of your gold and silver holdings that you can then use to go and buy real estate. So if you're into hard assets, you know, and you're, you've got gold and silver, you can collateralize that to, to go and purchase real estate. The same with art. That's also um, pretty popular with a lot of institutions and certain financial institutions. And then cryptocurrency is the same thing. Again, please do your research. Um, please, this is for educational purposes, but there are cryptocurrency platforms where you can actually uh, put your coins uh, and uh, with a custodian and they will issue up to 50% of the value of the coins and loans. Th this, by the way, is just a great um, information to have to when you're eventually going to see the opportunities that's available and in every downturn or recession or in uncharted territories or, or chaotic times, um, access to capital is key. So you want to you wanna know how, where to get it, what resources you have, what resources do, do you have that you can align to get to your, to get to your goals and, and your targets. So a, a big question that we have, right? So we're making our money. So where do we put our money? Where do we put our money that can be positioned very effectively uh, and efficiently and uh, help with this alignment of our resources towards our goals. So the, one of the big things that we want to look for is you want to have access to it. You want to be able to use it and you want to have control over it, right? Um, two, two big, big areas. So you, you know all the different options that you have. And that's why I'll touch, uh, touch a little bit about infinite banking and the Roth IRA. I love, I love it because there's a lot of those features available with them. Safe Harbor, harbor no loss provisions is an old, another one. Here's one of my favorite ones, tax-free growth and tax-free distribution. How about paying taxes on the seed, not the harvest? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, there's ways to absolutely do that. And I love, love that, that, that strategy. 
um, a competitive return, high contributions, uh, collateral uh, opportunities, which I just covered what that is and how powerful that can be, having different thing, uh, assets doing many different things for you. Guaranteed loan provisions, unstructured loan uh, payments, literally being your own bank, and then additional uh, benefits. What additional benefits can I, can I have in there? So I'm gonna to touch a little bit about infinite banking first. So infinite banking is taking that banking model, essentially that I shared earlier of how banks operate, but you're, you're implementing and executing a very similar strategy. You're just doing it with a, with a life insurance policy, a dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a mutual insurance company. This is a strategy that I've personally done uh, for over a decade, and it's pretty powerful. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of things. The first thing is these policies are structured very, very, very specifically. This is not your Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, whole life insurance policies. It's structured for high cash value. So in the first year, for example, in a policy such as that 70 to 80% um, of the, the, the money that you put into premiums should basically be available in cash, in ca in your cash value. So it's a little bit different. It's structured for the living benefits. The death benefit is there too, but specif specifically structured for, for living benefits. A mutual insurance company is also, um, I, <laughs> you have to have it with a mutual insurance company. They're not listed on the stock exchanges. They manage very, very differently. A lot of them have been around for over 100, 150 years, uh, they've been profitable for the same amount of time. Um, they're managed on behalf of the, the, the shareholders, which are the policy owners of, of the company. So it's very important to have it with a mutual insurance company. Um, and so one of the reasons why we, we, we utilize that is because you have immediate access and control over your money. It's very highly liquid. Where do you position money that you can access it pretty quickly? Um, when the world was finding itself in a pretty chaotic time uh, last year, um, I would say one of the, the great things was is I needed access to capital and I was able to get it within 48 hours deposited through an ACH from a mutual insurance company. So it's pretty liquid. It's not a checking account but it's pretty liquid. There's guarantees on principal and growth, about 4% tax-free over the life of the policy. Annual dividends could range between six to 7%. Dividends is the profit, uh, profit of the insurance company that is distributed to the shareholders, which are the policy owners. Um, there's tax-free growth and tax-free access. There's no contribution or distribution limits. Um, it's basically based on underwriting, which is your income and your net worth. It's a private contract, love that. So, you know, when you take a policy loan, it's not reported to credit agencies. In most states, is it, it, it uh, has asset protection. It varies from state to state. There's collateral opportunities. You can essentially do the same thing with a life insurance policy that a former mentor of mine 20 years ago did in the 70s with his CDs. Um, and then there's the great thing about this is the unstructured loan payments. You are literally in control of repaying the loans, uh, just like with the bank. You're making deposits into it, you're taking policy loans, investing in, in assets that generate cash flow, and you're in control of the cash flows of repaying that, those policy loans. You can also add fu uh, funding continuation riders, such as di disability riders or long-term care riders on it. And of course, there's a death benefit on the account um, and it's usually a multiple of the account value that goes tax-free to beneficiaries. That will become very, very important in the next couple of years. So um, especially through proper estate planning. So that's why we love using that vehicle as part of infinite banking. And I'll get into, I'll get into the strategy a little bit. But I think I've touched on this, that the policy is the primary uh, savings vehicle. I just wanted to reiterate a couple of points. It's a dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a mutual insurance uh, carrier. It's structured for maximum early cash value from year one, uh, not three or four or five years that you have to wait in it. Um, and you should have immediate access, uh, the car carriers right now, and within 30 days, you'll be able to take a policy loan. So this is essentially the strategy. Our own little banking system is we deposit money into the policy. Uh, the policy earns dividends and has guaranteed growth. We then take a policy loan to acquire an, an investment that produces cash flow, and the cash flow is used to put back into our own bank. It becomes our own 
back. Real estate is a great play to do this, taking the policy. You can either do it through a down payment or outright cash and then just cycle it through. And that's why it's called infinite banking because there's an infinite flow between deposits, uh, taking loans, cash flow, and then repaying those loans. And it's an ongoing process too. You know, um, one of my mentors, Mr. Nelson Nash, always talked about becoming your own banker. And the book is becoming because it's a process. It's not become your own banker, it's becoming. So it's a great lesson that I learned from him. I want to give you a quick example of why this is so powerful and why this can amplify what you do. This is, a, this is someone in our network, a client from my company, Producers Wealth. So he was a 40-year-old male, and his passive income goal was $360,000 a year. So he knew where he wanted to go from A to B. Um, he was going to do that through direct investing in real estate syndication at 8%. And he was saving approximately $200,000 per year. And again, these are just, you can add or subtract zeros. This was just a specific example. So we looked at results. So we said, if you don't reinvest the cash flows, it'll actually take you 22 and a half years to have 4.5 million deployed at 8%, $360,000 a year of leveraged income through this syndication. If you did invest those cash flows, it'll knock it down to about 11 to 12 years. And this is, a, again, another fantastic strategy. So we said to him, what if we ran this through infinite banking, we fund the policies, and then we take policy loans and invest in that. So we did the same thing, $200,000 per year, we put it in a policy for him. And in about 20 years, so around about the same time, 20 years, 4.5 deployed, um, $360,000 a year at 8%. So kind of the same thing. And if you reinvested the cash flows, which we didn't in the first um, example here, if you reinvest it about the same time, you're going to, um, you're going to get to, to your goal. So there's not a massive difference between the two. But the one thing that was pretty, pretty powerful, in addition to reaching his, his target, he had $1.46 million tax free in, inside that policy with a death benefit to transfer liquidity efficiently to trust and, and to his trust. And the powerful thing about this is we didn't make him a better investor. We didn't add more money or subtract more money. We just positioned capital efficiently. So um, it's pretty powerful. So the bonuses was using, you know, he had 1.46 million in this example tax free. There's a death benefit um, that, is at a multiple of the cash values. He had a disability waiver of premium on there as a business owner. So if something happens to him and he becomes disabled or can no longer operate in the capacity that he's operating in right now, the insurance company would cover the premiums. And there was an efficient tax-free transfer of wealth set up with some asset protection for him. The reason why I love these two uh, asset classes is I love real estate. I, start, I started as a real estate guy and continue to love real estate. Um, and it just amaze, uh, really just amazes me how many similarities there were between the two asset classes. So if this is the first time that this concept, um, or that you're hearing about this concept or someone has explained this, um, think of think of both of them as pretty similar assets. And the first time I said this to someone, you know, they were like, what are you talking about, MC? You've got to be crazy. But think about it this way. With real estate, you could take out a mortgage, right? And there's a specific uh, set uh, a number of payments that you have to make with a mortgage. The same thing with a life insurance contract. Could be 5, 10, 15, 20 years. When you pay your principal and your interest on a mortgage, you build up equity in the real estate. The same thing with a life insurance contract. You pay the premiums and you start building up equity pretty quickly in that policy. Now with real estate, how do you access that equity? Well, you could do it through collateralizing the equity through a HELOC, right? A home equity line of credit is a, way to, is a way to do that or refi. With life insurance, you could do it through a policy loan, which essentially acts as a uh, equity line of or a, a line of credit, uh, simple interest, making the payments back. Um, both of these produce cash flow, which is phenomenal. Real estate produce cash flow. That's that's why we love it. Life insurance produ produces cash flow. It's dividends. 
um, there's appreciation if you do it right in real estate and buy at the right time and properly manage the property, there'll be appreciation. At the same with a life insurance contract, the value of the contract will go up. The death benefit, which will be the liquidity that's transferred to your beneficiaries and your um, estate. There's tax advantages. We love real estate for its tax advantages. The life insurance is tax-free growth and then accessing the money tax-free, the dividends are tax-free, the policy loans, as I mentioned, are tax-free, and then the death benefit is transferred tax-free to the beneficiaries. You could use a little bit of leverage with both, both of it, controlled leverage. Here's a fun fact, you know, everyone's familiar with mortgage notes. We have a lot of great note investors in our, in our network. Um, you can also sell the life insurance contract. It's called buy settlements like you sell mortgage notes. Uh, banks lend on both of these, which is fascinating. Um, banks love to lend on real estate. They love to uh, lend on life insurance. It's called premium financing, a very popular strategy with family offices across the United States. And both, both of them, in a way, can act as an inflation hedge. So it's two pretty powerful asset classes. Here's another fun fact. You could do a 1031 exchange in real estate. You can do a 1035 exchange in insurance. So let's, let's talk about this, this one, two combo that we've got here to bring it all together. I love uh, a strategy where there's different horses. You know, one, um, one of my favorite things a friend spoke about uh, the other day was different horses for different courses. So what he means by that too, you know, we were talking about different invest, different investments and different stuff. So he's like, well, you got to have a stable. <laughs> you got to have a stable of horses. You have a forest horse, you have a war, a war horse and you have your everyday horse, right? So you bring it all together. And I love the combo that these two provide because as I mentioned, you know, in our philosophy, we love to pay Taxes on the seed, not the harvest. So infinite banking does that where you would take a loan from your policy. You would acquire real estate and produce cash flow with a Roth IRA. One of the great things to do that is to become a private lender. One of the strategies is funding that out and maxing that um, uh, your contributions out and using that for private lending on all the other many things that you can do with it. But one of those um, I just mentioned here is the private lending produces cash flow. It goes back in there and it grows tax free. And you're going to be able to access that tax free in your Roth IRA. So put the two of them pretty, pretty powerful. The one thing that I think is kind of humorous when I put the slide together too, is there was actually a newspaper that, you know, that kind of explained both in, uh, in, in an article online of how powerful the com combination of these two can be um, for you. So one of the things, so how can, how can we amplify this? And the two of them is max out your IRA contributions, you know, self-directed, of course, <laughs> if you haven't done that, please do that. Um, and you can invest through private lending. I just use that as an example. There's many other different things to do uh, with, uh, with that. Um, and then fund your infinite banking policy. What is great between the two of these is you can max out your IRA contributions and your, uh, your qualified retirement contributions. And then if there's money left over, well, now you, have a, now you know of a place that you can add on to it. So let's just say there's only a certain amount that you could put in there. Well, the rest now for your savings that you're trying to put away, now you could use, utilize this vehicle and use the, these two in combination. So you fund the policy, you take a policy loan to invest in the real estate. In this example, I was thinking about how powerful it is as a real estate investor, and I love, love to do this personally too, of investing as an equity investor and also debt. So to, be, to have a diversified real estate portfolio, you need a little bit of both for different reasons. And it's two vehicles that you could use in combination and accomplish both. Invest as an equity investor, utilizing the one vehicle and invest as a debt investor in the other one, um, uh, utilizing a different vehicle. So pretty powerful, very, very powerful stuff. So just want to throw that slide up there again. That's how you use your never tax assets to, together to amplify what you're doing as part of your strategy. So again, if you're building out your strategy, we want to go from A to B. We want to go from A to B as quickly as possible. So one of the key things is for us um, in the times that we're living is to be crystal clear about our vision our goals, know what we want to do, where we want to go, and the time frame in which we want to accomplish that. 
get clarity. Um, and then once we've achieved that, now we can, we can really build a strategy um, and manage our own wealth in a manner that's going to get us there in the quickest and fastest way. I want to finish with this slide again because it brings it all together, the framework of cre creating cash, making money, whether it's a business or in your employment, and then positioning your capital efficiently somewhere. And as I mentioned, two very powerful vehicles to use in that way is a self-directed Roth IRA and of course your infinite banking policy in there. There's other things that you can obviously position it into as well. Uh, like I said, you should have a stable of horses. Every horse has got a different job um, and then deploy that and invest in different assets that produce cash flow. We also have some cash growth and then cash control. So very, very powerful stuff. Um, for folks that are interested in a free video series, there's just, this is just educational stuff. We've put up, put out over 650 uh, podcast episodes. And there's also a series where we talk about more of these different strategies. It's at your own banking system.com. Um, you could check that out. And if you always want to reach out and chat MC at MC for folks in this community, that's my e email and address. If you want to get in touch and then also, you know, from a strategy uh, a point of view and the things that, uh, that we, that we put in place. If you want to follow and listen to our shows and, and join our community, the podcast in the community is at cashflow, cashflowninja.com. So I, th I think I've seen a couple of, um, I've seen a couple of questions here. So I, uh, Q and I, okay. I can click on these to see if folks can your self directed IRA be used. Uh, to make the initial payment into a dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a mutual insurance carrier question comes from Clifford. That's a great question. No, it can, um, it cannot. Uh, so you, and, and also because of the different advantages that both of these vehicles have, you want to keep them separate. So as I mentioned, um, a, a, a great strategy would be firstly to max out your, uh, your IRA, uh, and your qualified plans, your self-directed IRA, and then look at the other type of uh, resources that you have available and savings. And then if you're looking for a different place to position that, then you put it into uh, the infinite banking. So I wouldn't use the one to feed the other one. I would keep that separate and that's not an option uh, at this point as well. A great way for business owners, and I'm sure folks have probably shared this um, in, in probably different content pieces to find access to money to fund uh, IRAs and infinite bankings and so forth, especially if you're a business owner is uh, employing your children in your business in some way, shape or form. Obviously there's an entire checklist that you have to follow and I'm not an accountant or a CPA and I don't play one on YouTube, but it's a pretty powerful strategy that you can look into to find access to funds for that. MC, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, Finally uh, figured it out, but good job answering those questions. I also, <laughs> I also saw a question. Um, some people were asking if they could get a copy of your slides. Absolutely. Be happy to uh, share the slides and you can, uh, you can get a copy of them. Should they just uh, email you and ask for them? Yes, absolutely. You can email me at mc, mc at mclobster.com. Great. Let's see couple of other frequently uh, asked questions. I can cover a couple until there's, there's more questions coming in. Um, you know, we talked a little a big picture strategy because I wanted to be very, very intentional to show you the big picture because uh, I would say, you know, with, with these policies too, you know, there's a, obviously, there's a lot of, a lot of options available. So I would say the, the, you know, one of the things that, that people ask me is like, well, do I just buy the real estate? Do I put something here? It all depends. You, you have to position your capital somewhere. So this is a place to position capital just as it is in an IRA, for example. So it's a, it's a, it becomes another vehicle as part of your overall, of your overall strategy. Um, I would say underwriting. So here's another question that folks ask. You know, we have clients uh, all over the country at different ages you know, some in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even someone in their uh, 70s, which is a question I get all the time. Um, there's different strategies for every person on their journey 
uh, in different stages of their life. So when you're starting out, obviously you're young, there's a lot of time, you don't have a lot of resources yet, or maybe you're not earning a lot of, of money yet. And if you get into your 30s and 40s, now you've built up resources, uh, there's some nice income. And then in your 50s, 60s and 70s, you've obviously built up uh, a lot of resources on your journey. There's different strategies and ways to utilize this in all of them. Uh, even children policies, there's a lot of folks that set up policies for their children as another savings vehicle to complement what they, what they have set up already. Um, so we see a lot of grandparents, a lot of parents setting up policies uh, for their children. So that's, that's another question that I get constantly is, does it make sense for everyone? It, there's, a different, um, there's different strategies for everyone. I'll give you an example uh, of actually the folks that we've been working with. So we are working with this one couple for three years and they picked 2020 as a year for their retirement. So can you believe it? So 2020 was the year they retired and obviously 30 to 40% initially the market dropped, right? But so they called me up to say, MC, what do we do? Like we were retiring this year. We're now trying to draw money. You know, our, our accounts or values are down 30 to 40%. But they, three years ago, um, prior to that, had started to set up policies to fund some tax-free retirement out of their policies. Because you could essentially, for a policy, you can essentially take distributions from it for retirement tax-free when that time uh, time comes around. So what we were able to do is they were able to take money from their policy uh, in 2020, wait until the market came back up, and then they moved everything into cash and were setting up two new policies for them. But the, essentially what this did was it act as a volatility buffer, because that's another question that I get. I, MC, I have a 401k, I have an IRA, I have a self-directed IRA, like depending on what, what it's invested in, let's just say it's in an equities, it serves as a, a, a really good volatility buffer to access capital when you need it for retirement, instead of drawing from, um, I would say at that stage, a retirement account that's down 30 to 40%, right? How much would you need to earn on that just to get back to where you were if you were gonna live off that account that year? And then, and then uh, you know, drawing it down and obviously waiting for the market to come back up. Let me see. I think we had another question. Let me see if you click into the chat there. Yep. Perfect. There we go. Um, my one company uh, produces well do, uh, does do that. So, um, you know, you can get in touch with us uh, if you're looking and in, interest, uh, interested to set that up. So we work with a couple of different carriers. Um, the reason why we focus heavily on education is we want to just share this with folks and get this information out there because it's pretty powerful. But the one comp my one company, Producers Wealth, well, does do that so you can reach out to us. There's also another question. Can you name the great news article that talked about two vehicles together? Yeah, yeah. So I can actually get a link on that. So if you email me, I could get the link. Uh, I read a lot, so <laughs> I don't remember. The, I read a lot from a lot of different resources. So send that to me. Uh, just send me an email. I'll, I'll get a link. And you can also, if you just do a Google search, you know, Roth IRA and, and uh, high cash value life insurance combination or something like that, you'll find some stuff online too. We also had another question. Do you have to be an accredited investor? Um, we probably need more details as to what you're trying to do, but um, you don't need to be an accredited investor to get a policy if that's what you're asking, correct, MC? You do not need to be an accredited investor. Uh, most, and this is, this ties, this is a good question. So for underwriting purposes, um, number one, you don't need to be an accredited investor. There's truly no minimums. When it starts to make sense is around about $10,000 a year, at least in the policy, because 30% of that will probably go to insurance costs. So when it starts to make sense uh, initially, and then um, is, is around about there and insurance companies, uh, uh, most of them will underwrite you and allow you to put into these policies up to 25% of your income, or depending on your net worth or liquid assets, they take that into consideration too. But that's also uh, that's also a great um, that's also a great way to think about it, because eventually, and that's why you know I've seen the combination between the IRAs and this use really in in a really powerful fashion because you'll max out the contributions to the qualified plans. Then, well, where do you put other savings? Um, 
So our goal should be at least to, to save approximately 40 to 50% uh, of our income. Uh, so let me just see. There was, it seems, chat. <clears throat> I got another question. Can you self, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, can you self-direct your Roth IRA to invest in an LLC? The answer is yes, it can't be your own LLC, but you can invest into an LLC or other entities. Yep. Yeah, so the underwriting, st staying on the, the, the topic of underwriting. So here's another question that, that I get asked is, what if I am not insurable? What if there was an event or something, a health issue? Now, the answer is there's many different options available. So we've worked with couples where, let's just say, the one spouse is not insurable at that time, where some of these policies can then be structured on the other spouse, and both of them can be the owners of the policy, which means it's a savings vehicle for both of them. Um, so there's many different uh, options available. It's not just you're uninsurable, sorry, bad luck. <laughs> you know, there's uh, different options available for folks. Um, well, the, I would say the question Michelle asked, if you had $75,000 from a settlement, how would you invest it? That is a very specific question. And that is a question that you, you would have to ask your advisor. So we cannot give blanket advice, <laughs> not knowing uh, a lot about you. So I would, uh, that's not something that we would answer on this. What I would say is that you could use the framework that, uh, that we shared here today to create and craft a strategy for you. Um, so yeah, start with the vision of where you wanna go, what you want your life to look like, what are some of your goals and your targets, and then build out your strategy. And maybe that'll help formulate an answer for you eventually of what you should do with that. Great, well, I think um, we're out of time here today, but, uh encourage you guys to reach out to MC if you have any further follow-up questions. If you have anything regarding self-directed IRAs, you can um, email me at rfisher at camaplan, fishers with a C, R-F-I-S-C-H-E-R at C-A-M-A-P-L-A-N, or it can be reached at 215-283-2868. Again, 215-283-2868. And our website has a bunch of information uh, for you as well at camelplan.com. Uh, I appreciate this great information that you provided us with today, MC, and uh, look forward uh, to our next meeting. Absolutely. I just want to thank everyone for their time and thank you for the opportunity to share a couple of things with you. And I will also say, definitely go and check out, if, if you have not, uh, Maggie did a great interview on the Cashflow Ninja. Ryan did a great interview with me. And then Carl also did a great interview to learn more about their journeys. They did a phenomenal job. Uh, it was a great episode. So appreciate everyone. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. You're welcome, MC. Thanks for all of you attending today. Bye-bye. Uh,